Welcome on into the Wolverine.com podcast. Clayton Safey here with Chris Ballas and Anthony Broom, both of whom are in Minneapolis. We're going to get a vibe check from them ahead of the Frozen Four Michigan against Boston College tonight. Uh, we'll get that in just one second. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to like the video if you want the Michigan hockey team to win the national championship, the Michigan football team to win the national championship. Give us a thumbs up, leave a comment, subscribe to our channel. And as always, you can head to the Wolverine.com right now. We got a special offer for podcast listeners and viewers. The promo code UM1 gets you two months of premium access. Abs uh, not absolutely free for absolutely $1. Uh, so 50 cents a month over the next two months, pretty much free. If you really want, hit us up on Twitter. I'll Venmo you a dollar. It'll get you in for two months. No big deal. So uh, take advantage of that right now. Uh, fellas, you guys are both in Minnesota for the Frozen Four tonight. Um, so, you know, some people may be listening after the fact, but, and we will, we'll be able to time travel in, in that case and, and they'll know the outcome, but how are the vibes, uh, as ahead of tonight's game against Boston college? Uh, you know, Michigan's confident and I love that they love to be the underdog here. Right. And they feel like everybody's kind of overlooking them and, uh, let's not look, overlook the fact that this is an extremely talented team that probably underachieved a little bit during the year. And now they're finding their stride. And when they got desperate, fellas, they went six and one down the stretch to get into the tournament, get a three seed, probably could have easily won the Big Ten tournament had they gotten a better whistle. Um, and instead, they go out and win the one that matters, right, in the elite eight of hockey and to get to the Frozen Four, beat the Spartans, Michigan State five to two. And uh, so, you know what, in talking to them and listening to them speak, uh, they are really relishing this role and uh, and really feel like they've got an opportunity here. I wouldn't say to shock the world, guys, but I do think that most people favor Boston College, and for a good reason. They've won 14 in, in a row. Uh, these guys are playing great hockey, but they're young. And you know what it reminds me of? Kind of the younger Michigan teams that got to the tournament. And, I mean, last year they were 15 and 16. Now they're freshmen and sophomores. You know what? Uh, this is going to be their really their first opportunity in the Frozen Four. Really easily could have lost the last game. Uh, Michigan's talking about how their experience in the last two is really going to help them, and I think it will. I think Michigan's got a great chance to win this game, and I think they feel that way. Yeah, I mean, current vibe check, a quick travel clarification as we record this. I'm actually in the heart of Big Ten country. I'm in Madison, Wisconsin, continuing to work my way to okay. St. Paul. So a shout out to the Badgers. A couple more hours left on the drive. But um, yeah, the, the one thing I'll say is how many times has Michigan gone into this tournament, you know, similarly discussed as, you know, this Boston College team is where they're loaded with all this talent. Uh, you know, they're, they're coming on a roll and then bounce of the puck one way or another. And all of a sudden you're back on a bus or on a plane to Ann Arbor. So, um, you know, this Michigan team uh, is filled with, you know, a lot of talent in its own right. You know, you've got some NHL guys there. You've got, you know, a hot goalie here in the postseason. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I think both of these games, again, um, you know, you look at some of these NHL mock drafts and you look at, uh, you know, everything that's out there in terms of how good of a, a weekend of hockey this could be in the Twin Cities. It's, it's going to be a lot of fun, and I'm excited to, to head that way and cover it. And uh, hopefully we're covering a game Saturday, but we'll see what happens from there. You hitchhiking, A.B., or how you getting up there? <laughs> uh, just, you know, little by little. All right. drive, little drive here, little drive there. Stop here, stop there. A uh, little go. beer tour as well. So Love it. So we're in three total states. Yeah, that's my bad. Um, so predictions, are they going to win tonight? I think they are. I, you know what? There's just something that tells me it's their time. They've gotten here so many times, and everybody's like, well, they can never finish, you know, and, I, and they're like five out of 29 or whatever that they've, you know, uh, and, and when they get to the Frozen Four uh, or five of the last whatever. And, okay, and here's what I'm saying. If you look at Minnesota, if you look at Boston College, if you look at Boston U, you're talking about five out of 29 or five out of 25, five out of 23. It is really, really hard, guys, to finish the job, right? I think North Dakota is the one that's got like nine out of 19 or something like that, which is pretty remarkable um, if you look at it almost 50 percent. So but uh, here's the thing. I, I, again, it's going to come down to goaltending as well. Jake Barjeski is playing extremely well, playing with a lot of confidence. Uh, that's going to be huge. Can't allow the soft goals that they allowed in the last year's game to Quinnipiac when we were there. Disappointing. That cannot happen. So, uh, But I don't expect it to happen. I think these guys are playing with a lot of confidence. I like Michigan, uh, something like 4-3 or 5-4, fellas. I just have a feeling. Yeah, I think the the over under on on the game is seven goals scored. If Michigan can keep it under that, I feel like their chances are a lot better than if you're in a shootout. 
Um, you know, Boston College's goalie is extremely good as well. So I feel like, again, it, it's either going to have to be one of those, you know, games where, you know, Barczewski's standing on his head and, and Michigan just does enough, or otherwise you probably have to score five, six goals to win this game. So, again, um, obviously major key, scoring more goals than the other team. But, um, you know, it does feel like there's a team of destiny type of thing going on here. I think that, you know, would Michigan have preferred to play better hockey earlier in the year? Absolutely, they would have. But there's something to be said about how you play this time of year. And um, maybe third time's a charm when it comes to, you know, coming in with a little lower expectations, but, you know, a lot bigger of an opportunity to make some noise. Unless, it, you know, the defense has been playing much better, too. If they play the way that they have recently compared to the way that they were playing, giving up so many odd man rushes earlier in the year, guys, they're going to be okay. So lots of talent. Uh, Got to get these guys, get, get, them, get to the uh, – Get, slow them down before they get going because there's a lot of speed out there for Boston College. AB, is that a Michigan prediction then? Uh, sure, why not? We'll say <laughs> Michigan. Uh, we'll say Michigan three, Boston College two. Wow. Okay. Yeah. What the hell? I'm just gonna pick them too, just because why not? Um, they are a pretty heavy underdog in this game. Over under is seven and a half. AB, I, I agree with you. I mean, it seems like Boston College just scores pretty much at will and, and has over. The last stretch when you look at the uh you know their schedule and the in the box scores and everything um but it's it's going to be fun to see if if michigan can do it um third straight appearance a lot of these guys have been here before as you said chris earlier they kind of have the experience this time which is you know a little bit different uh, t- uh type of backdrop you know than than the last couple for michigan with those really young teams and sounds like gavin brindley's leading uh leaning towards coming back so could have some experience and and other guys but uh, experience next year too but the time's now you don't you don't wait till next year uh so yeah follow our coverage at the wolverine.com for michigan hockey we got a couple guys one guy there one guy on the way there but both will be there tonight uh for the game against boston college let's gonna do some michigan football but before we do want to talk about our commemorative issue of the wolverine magazine 140 pages of Michigan football analysis, columns, interviews, features, everything from the 2023 National Championship season. The link to order is in the description to the video and the podcast here, as well as at the WolverineOnDemand.com. We have both the soft cover version, just the magazine with the glossy pages and everything else, and the book as well, hardcover book, which looks fantastic. Uh, I would recommend the book. It costs a little bit more, but it is worth it. So head over to the wolverineondemand.com to order your copy today. Let's talk some Michigan football. We spoke with Tony Elford yesterday, new Michigan running backs coach who was wearing blue uh, for the first time. He said since since he came over, uh, you know, he puts on the blue. He's, He's putting on all his Michigan gear. And he said it was the first time he's worn blue since he coached at Notre Dame back in 2014 obviously he comes over after nine seasons at ohio state and that was kind of the the biggest thing he was asked about naturally is hey why are you standing here in glick field house after you know choosing to leave ohio state and he said you know it was the opportunity he loves sharon Moore. he's known him for a long time but i thought the most interesting thing that he said to me was um the difference or maybe he didn't want to get too much into differences between the two programs, but just what he was saying about Michigan and what he liked about Michigan. And then kind of you couple that with the context of everything we know about Ohio state, but I was going back through it this morning. He said the word toughness seven different times about Michigan. He talked about the culture and I asked him, you know, were you able to tell that they had this great culture from the other sideline and watching them on film and preparing for them the last you know, however many years. And he said, yeah, it, it was definitely something that was there. Now he's going to be a part of that. He said the number one thing he looks for in a back is toughness. Uh, so I think he's he's a good fit there, but was a really impressive dude, um, you know, to, to kind of hear talk about his vision and, and the running backs and everything else. But, you know, I thought there was a pretty clear comparison there between Michigan and Ohio State when, when you look at his comments. Yeah, obviously I was on a plane and I didn't get to hear his comments until later. Did anybody ask about catapult or where the bodies were buried? (laughs) No, that that would have been your your question, though. That would have been my question. That's okay. Um, 
here's here's the interesting part about that, right? If Ohio State wants to send PIs now and stuff like that uh, and do some digging into Michigan, and again, Michigan strongly believes that some of this investigation, if not most of it, was really started by Ohio State. And uh, then uh, all they have to do is say, uh, okay, Tony, you know, what do you got? You know, so maybe this gets them to back off a little bit too. Uh, you know, let's be honest. If you, if you haven't thought about that, that's something that kind of interested me. It's like, okay, uh, Tony Alford knows every secret over in there in that building. So uh, obviously that's not why they hired him though. They hired him because he's a great running backs coach and a very good receiver or a very good recruiter. Uh, even though Ohio state fans are saying, Oh, I didn't recruit anybody. And EJ Holland, our EJ Holland has said many times, you know what, uh, look at the guys that he's already bringing in and that he's already contacting. And uh, of course you have to land him. And of course, it's not up to one guy to do that, fellas. It's up to a good NIL program, too. So uh, we'll see what he does. But I love the addition. Um, we told you early on, you know what? There was a big name out there that uh, if they land him, boy, this is going to be uh, pretty, pretty interesting. And sure enough, here we are. So uh, I think the kids have responded extremely well to him. It sounds like Donovan Edwards has been playing with him a little bit, Clay, um, and kind of needling him a little bit, about three straight. Uh, He doesn't have any pairs of gold pants, but now he's got an opportunity to get, what is it? Michigan's got a little, uh, I think, a charm that they they give out for beating Ohio State now on a necklace, if I'm not Well, he has gold pants to be. Yeah, but not in the last three years. Is my yes, yes. Yes. So uh so now he can he can work on getting that charm here. And uh and you know what? If Michigan finds a quarterback, they're gonna have a great opportunity, in my opinion. But I like this guy, like the hire, like the staff overall, and uh, I'm excited to see what they do if they get a quarterback. Yeah, the thing that struck me yesterday is that I mean, immediately, obviously, what what is the the topic that is gonna come up first when we talk to Tony Alford for the first time? What led you to Michigan? Why, why did you leave Ohio State? All of those types of things. So, um, you know, I've got Buckeye fans in my mentions on Twitter saying like, oh, this is typical Michigan media. You have a good football team that uh, you could focus on, but you always got to make it about Ohio State and uh, have some self-awareness. Like it, it's a big, this is a big lieutenant of Ohio State football that jumps sides of the rivalry and that is going to be a part of this thing now. And it's not like we, we're sitting outside um, you know, the Alglick field house with pitchforks and torches and demanding he come out and give us answers on why he decided to do what he did. Uh, basically what he said is that it was just time. He had been there for nine years, um, admitted that he felt like maybe he maybe had even professionally maxed out there. Uh, so it was time for another opportunity. And it just so happened Michigan was the, the opportunity. And now it's interesting that he kind of has that holy trinity, or maybe not a holy trinity, but trinity of uh, Midwest blue one of blood us, schools now. Um, and it ain't the yeah, one of them is. That's true. <laughs> that's true. Uh, Notre Dame, Ohio State, Michigan. But yeah, I mean, I like the, uh, you know, there's a there's like a quiet gravitas about him. You can tell that he's going to command the respect of a room. Obviously, he's got a pedigree of developing and recruiting talent. Um, you know, we have multiple stories up on, on what he said about. Donovan Edwards and his running back room and his recruiting philosophy all over at the Wolverine.com. But I, I was just, you know, a, a very, um, I was very impressed, uh, but not surprised because he's long been one of the best position coaches in college football. And I think Michigan's very lucky to have him. Yeah. And, and uh, what Chris, you were referring to there is apparently Donovan Edwards every day has been saying, Hey, I've never lost to you coach. So uh you, pretty great and you can picture donovan saying it too uh which makes it even better um, you can hear the voice <laughs> exactly and so he's got him to work with and, and look donovan edwards was a guy he almost landed at ohio state he was a guy that, that they built a connection there he said as we know and as our recruiting reporters over at the wolverine.com have reported you know he's connected with jordan marshall a guy who he actually missed on uh at ohio state but will now coach when Jordan arrives this summer, top 100 running back out of Cincinnati. So, uh, and Micah Kapana as well, who will arrive this summer. So they've got a lot of talent to work with. A couple other notes is just that he said Kalel Mullings, he's been impressed with him. Uh, he's still trying to kind of become a running back and, and just kind of learn all the ins and outs of the position. Uh, but he said Donovan Edwards is, is bigger and, and stronger than maybe he thought he was going to be when he was a recruit. Uh, but he's obviously seen him up close and personal over the last couple of years and then put on the weight uh, this offseason. Cole Cabana working through some things injury-wise. He said Ben Hall has been 
uh, very good this spring. So excited to see those guys in the spring game. Not sure how much we're going to see of of the Don, uh, but but we shall see next weekend already. Um, let's move to Lamar Morgan. This is a guy, uh, Michigan's uh, defensive backs coach, pass game coordinator. I want to have dinner with this guy. Uh, he said he goes out. He's a foodie. He's been to 50 establishments in Ann Arbor since he's arrived, uh, wow. 40 to 50. And he said he'll he'll go order like 250, 300 dollars worth of food, and like get everything and try everything. So if anyone asks him, "Hey, what's good over at this place?" he knows like four or five things. So I would love the I would love to partake in one of those if I ever get the invite. But he's another guy like Anthony. You were talking about just how impressive he, uh, Tony Alford was talking, and I'm sure you share the same view. Lamar Morgan can command a room too. He was awesome to talk to. Um, and one of the most interesting things, too, when you have another new position coach, you know, I asked him what was his view of Michigan, obviously watching them the last couple of years under Jesse Minter defensively because he had worked with Jesse at Vanderbilt in 2021. And he said it was that it was clear as day that they played with a blue collar mentality, but not that they didn't have talent. You know, he said some people think blue collar means you just don't have talent. You only work hard. He said it's a blue collar mentality with talented players. I thought it was a great way to put it. You know, it's something kind of we've talked about over the last three years in, in different ways of how Michigan has risen to this point as a program. Um, but I, I just thought, and, and he said, you know, it kind of starts with Will Johnson where he's this extremely talented guy, but he's said that Will Johnson's the ultimate teammate he's ever been around where you kind of have this culture combined with talent, good, good coaching, um, you know, uh, just, guys that know how to win and that's why you've seen this successful run for Michigan over the last three years. Yeah. The interesting thing, look how in great shape he is for eating all that food. I know. Right? Number one. Uh, I wonder if he's been to Mr. Spots. Did anybody ask him that? That should have been the first question. True. Cheese steak and wings. We'll, um, we'll have to follow up on that. So, uh, but when I heard the first time I heard anything about him, I thought this guy sounds like he'd be a great hire, right? Anybody that works with Jesse Minter and that Jesse Minter recommends to me is going to be a guy I want because Jesse Minter is one of the best in the business. He's one of the best that we ever covered in terms of dealing with the media and giving answers. Um, you know what? He, he, it was clear that he knew football. And so if he recommends him, then uh, great. Uh, he's going to have his, his work cut out for him now, obviously with Rod Moore not being involved uh, out with a knee injury, but um there are still some pieces back there, guys, and I think he understands that. You know, it's obviously going to come down to the other corner and to the safety depth. As as fortunate as they were last year, guys, with on the injury front, um, you know, they're off to a bad start here this year. But that's how much more fortunate they're going to have to be this year because the depth just isn't there right now. So, but I like what I heard from him as well. I thought the questions were great. Uh, I really really believe that this defense is going to be special. I think that the back end is going to be a big part of it. If they continue to play with that blue chip edge, that blue collar edge, right? And I think they will. I just think that the the leadership back there, I look at the linebackers, everything I've heard about them. We know how good the defensive line is going to be if they stay healthy. And the defensive line sets the tone for everything else. So guys, I was looking at that schedule. I just booked my flight to Washington. And hopefully you guys have done that too. And if not, then get on that because uh, we got some unbelievable games to cover this fall. And I usually don't wish my summers away, but with this team, this defense and um, the schedule, I can't wait to see these guys in action. Yeah. And part of it too is, is, you know, this is a defensive meeting room with Link Martindale at the head of it, where you have, I believe, every single guy that has defensive coordinator experience. So for all the narratives about about it, oh, well, Wink is the OG of the system, and this is Wink's defense, and gosh darn it, he's going to do it the way he wants to do it. it. There's a really good nucleus and exchange of ideas going on in that room, too. So, you know, I don't expect them to be, you know, so fixed in what they're you know, what a philosophy is or the best way to call the defense. I think there's going to be some decent check. Wink Martindale is the CEO of all of that. But yeah, Lamar Morgan was, uh, you know, the funny thing about talking to really, I mean, we've spent the entire spring talking to pretty much brand new assistants, brand new coaching staff. Um, you see the guy, you know, at first they're a little, you know, they're a little guarded, maybe a little nervous, but then, you know, they really do get comfortable. And when you open up, you have a, guys that have, I think, good personalities and are, and are very good teachers of football. So when you look at Lamar Morgan as the piece of that, you know, that defensive staff, 
I think the out, you know, one of the bigger things we'll look at moving forward is who does succeed Wink Martindale uh, if if he decides to move on, go back to the NFL or retire, whatever it is. Um, it's going to be interesting to see which guy emerges as maybe the front runner for that. But uh, Lamar Morgan, to me, I could not have been more impressed. And, you know, to me, I, it's um, you just see how he'll be able to connect with players and, you know, just really good guy. And it was nice to get to know him yesterday. Yeah, a couple other notes. He said Rod Moore the day after he suffered the knee injury. He was the first guy in. He was the he was sitting in the front row in every meeting. That he's been incredible. He said we can't call him Coach Moore because there already is a Coach Moore, but he's Coach Rod Moore, and he's been doing a great job helping his teammates. And obviously, like you said, CB. I mean, they're going to need guys to step up there uh, depth wise, and um, you know. But I think, look, I mean, Rod Moore him being able to help those guys along, I think can, can be to their benefit. You, you already have Makari page, Quentin Johnson, both guys have played a lot of football, especially page. Um, and then I thought the interesting thing was too, you know, he mentioned different guys at corner. He said, we're rotating a bunch of guys through that's what the spring's all about that sort of thing. Um, which is, you know, to be expected, but then he's asked about Mikey Sanders still, Hey, who's going to replace Mikey Sanders still. And the first guy he said, and really the only guy he said in response to that question was he thinks Zeke Barry uh, could be, you know, somebody in that role at nickel, um, you know, played safety throughout his career, his first two years, but hasn't really gotten the opportunity in games, was kind of passed up again by a lot of those guys that were the depth for Michigan last year at safety, um, but a guy that could kind of come into his own. Jade McBurrow's also repping there. You know, we know Cody Jones is kind of, you know, a nickel by trade, but I think Zeke Barry is one of the guys guys I'm most excited to watch next weekend in the spring game. He, he had a good spring game last year, just didn't see him a lot during the season. Great athlete. And, uh, you know, I love those great athletes that can also play football. you got great athletes that yeah. aren't great football players, but I think that he's both. And I think he's got the potential anyway to be both. So, um, you know, when Rod Moore went down, you're wondering what Keon Saab was thinking. And, uh, you know, having transferred to Alabama, it's like, whatever, uh, he's not here anymore. And as Rich Rodriguez says, the only thing that I'll ever quote Rich Rod on was we only talk about the guys who want to put that would play for Michigan, you know? So, uh, <laughs> we're going to talk about the guys that are, that are still here. And, uh, and, uh, one of those guys is Zeke Berry. I love him. Uh, I really like what I'm hearing about Makari page though, stepping up. And I think people are overlooking him as uh, a potential difference maker back there. You know, no, he doesn't, does he have the instincts that Rod Moore had? No, but who does? Right. Uh, we're talking about a guy who just uh, would, like Marcus Ray. Right. Who was always, you know, seemed to know where the football was going. And uh, but they're all going to benefit from having a guy like Will Johnson back there um, in, as a corner uh, to help take away half the field. And then you can take some chances as, as a safety. So um, to me, it's a strong or strong room. Quentin Johnson coming back is absolutely huge. The people that we've talked to that have been at practice say he's an absolute rock in terms of just being a leader on that team. They think he's, there's no question he's going to be a captain. He's the old man in the room now. So uh, we'll see what happens, but yeah, they're going to be, they're going to be fine. Uh, they're going to be better than fine. I uh, need one more corner probably to step up in that Josh Wallace role. DJ Waller, I think has been banged up a little bit from what we've heard. So, but if they can find somebody back there, guys, again, this is going to be, this defense is going to be really, really tough to move on. Yeah. The hype around Zeke Barry, I'm happy to see because he's a guy that last year that, I think he dealt with an injury in fall camp and, and you're maybe looking at him last year being a breakout player. Maybe he's the guy that winds up being that third safety instead of Keon Saab. So um, you know, to me, it, it's going to be really interesting to see if he can stay healthy that, uh, you know, it, is it in a safety role? Is it in the nickel role? Uh, I think they've got some good battles there. And I know last year they had to kind of dip into the portal uh, to grab Josh Wallace. I don't, necessarily know that they'll need to do that this year i think they like jair hill i think they like dj waller again assuming good health um you know another body couldn't hurt probably at pretty much every spot on defense but i think they're in a really healthy position there on that side of the ball Keyshawn harris also got a mention at corner a sixth year who like i mean he's not the most dynamic guy in the world he's very fast um based on you know being a track athlete that he started his career at at Michigan, but he's a guy that I think you can trust there if you had to go, um, you know, and, and use some of your depth. But uh, let's move on to Michigan basketball and, and finish out with that. A new assistant coach hire with, a, you know, somewhat of a surprise last night, Wednesday night, 
uh, with John Rothstein reporting that Dusty May is set to hire Justin Joyner, who was one of the associate head coaches at St. Mary's under Randy Bennett. He's been there uh, the last seven years, got promoted to uh, associate head coach, one of two associate head coaches on staff uh, before the 2022-2023 season. Um, but, you know, when you kind of look at this staff that Dusty May's filling out now, you kind of got every corner of the country uh, in terms of ties and, and recruiting and all that covered, um, you know, where he's going to be your West Coast guy. He played uh, college basketball on the West Coast. And you also, uh, you know, you think about just the different connections that all these guys are going to have because Dusty May talked about in his introductory press conference, even when you're looking at the transfer portal, you may not know a kid. You don't have time to get to know the parents and the uncle and the and everybody around him. But if you have enough people in your network, you can kind of get to know or, or, you know, understand who these kids are because it is a risk anytime you take a kid that you don't know that well out of the transfer portal. So really wide uh, net there. He's been a, a good recruiter at St. Mary's, which also recruits well internationally. Could be an X factor there. Uh, but your guys' thoughts on the hire? Yeah, a lot of it's going to depend on NIL when it comes to these guys that are great recruiters. And so Michigan's got to up their game there and we'll continue to say that. I do wonder what role now Kyle Church will have. Uh, Dusty Maid was telling people that Kyle Church is coming. Um, he, he had a conference call the other day, a couple of days ago, uh, Mike Boynton, Hakeem Miskneen, uh, Kyle Church. So now Justin Joyner. And uh, you can have five coaches, but only three of them can recruit. So who's going to be the guy that doesn't recruit and what's his role going to be? So that'll be interesting. Also heard that he's bringing one of his guys, I believe, uh, to be the director of basketball operations. So, um, yeah, I'm anxious to hear what the roles are going to be and how they fill them. So when they are made official. So uh, that's going to be interesting. But no question that these he's got a strong staff uh, and, and a strong staff of recruiters I like these guys a ton. And more than anything, I like Dusty May. Right. I was talking to Zach Novak yesterday about him. and He'd spoken with him and he said this guy gets it. Um, Talk to John Beeline about him, and you will see that you know this guy is just a worker, and he's doing it a lot of the way that that John Beeline was doing it, right? When uh, you, no stone left unturned, looking at uh, you know at every single guy, but not just taking a guy because he's highly rated, building a roster and seeing how they fit together. So that's what excites me about him. I think he's going to be uh, an outstanding hire here. Uh, the more I hear about him, the more I like. And I really believe with his X's and O's and, you know, the way he's continued to adapt, the way he's willing to lean on people like John Beeline, uh, he's really going to, he's just guys a home run hire. I like it a lot. Uh, you know, you look at this, this three man uh, assistant coaching staff, Mike Boynton, again, we've, we've sung his praises. Akeem Miskadeen has, has been a good recruiter and a guy that uh, Dusty's worked with in the past. And, uh, you know, Justin Joyner, you know, when you bring a guy over from St. Mary's, um, that's a program that has somewhat quietly been very good over the last I don't know, two decades under Randy Bennett. Uh, they kind of get overshadowed because of just how dominant Gonzaga has been out there. But, you know, like that he's, again, you everything that kind of dusty, you know, all these little pieces he's putting together so far with his staff, uh, you look at, I think they're up to what, 32 or 33 guys that they've made contact with in the transfer portal. I mean, he said he was going to cast a wide net, and by golly, he has. So um, now that you have this assistant coaching staff set, and again, everything's pending, probably the same things with football, the background checks, and and making sure that uh, the official announcements go out. But uh, when you look at what the bedrock of of this early part of the Dusty, Mer uh, Dusty May era is going to be, it, it's, it's hard to give it anything but an A. I think they've done a tremendous job, and now you got to build a roster, and there's a lot to still sort out there. Could have as many as eight, nine, ten scholarship spots to fill. So uh, it's time to get to work there. And now it seems like he's got his lieutenants in line to go out and help him do that. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see the exact roles for each of these guys on staff because you can have five who can be on the floor with that rule being passed last year. A year ago, it was Jay Smith and Jerron Simmons who were elevated to that role in addition to their other jobs. But a lot of schools you're seeing – now kind of build their staff with five guys listed as assistant coaches. Three can go on the road to recruit, but it's not that big of a deal anymore that you can't go on the road to recruit because you can sit back and watch synergy clips and film of guys in the transfer portal. And I think coaches are probably going to be hitting the road less and, and probably already have given the way things have gone and how you build a roster these days. So 
uh, in, in, you know, Michigan doesn't have much of a roster right now. And a lot of that's going to have to be built through the portal, which is calls, Zoom calls, bringing guys in uh, on visits, which we will talk about right now. Uh, dead period ending this weekend being uh, a visit weekend for Michigan basketball, which will have Vlad Golden and Danny Wolf, two big men on campus, um, you know, a bunch of other targets, several of them looking to set up visits. Roddy Gale from Ohio State being one of them, Dante Maddox Jr. being another. Uh, Drew Thelwell, point guard from Moorhead State, is looking to set up a Michigan visit. And then a pair of Auburn guards, Aiden Holloway, uh, and who is the other one? Donaldson. Uh, yeah, Trey Donaldson, who kind of platooned at point guard last year for Auburn. So I don't know that you're going to get just their platoon, but maybe one out of the two and a lot of buzz right now about Donaldson at this point. But Holloway as well. His sister is going to be a freshman on the Michigan women's basketball team uh, next season in uh, 2024 signee. And then his grandfather, Dave Ramey, was a standout football player for Michigan in kind of a forgettable three, four year stretch there in the early 60s under Bump Elliott. One of their seasons being a two and seven year and all that. But he was very good. He led the team in scoring uh, and touchdowns three straight years. He's got the Michigan ties, but uh, a bunch there, obviously, with a bunch of targets we named. But. Michigan starting, you know, I think we'll start to see movement in terms of commitments and that sort of thing probably next week after some of these visits. Yeah, and Connor Asijan wants to visit as well. So there have been some buzz about Nebraska, but he's still very interested in Michigan too. I can guarantee you that. So, uh, yeah, things. I think pieces are going to start to fall in place. And uh, But, again, what I'm encouraged about is that he's not just taking a kid that says, okay, a highest bidder, I want to come, you know, give me a million and I'll show up. He wants to make sure he's a good fit, that he uh, appreciates everything about the program that he's trying to build. Well, you cast the wide net. You know, that's why you put all the offers out there. So when your top target decides he can't come or can't get admitted or wants the NIL bag, you have options there. You know, one of the things, the damning things about the way that Michigan's roster was put together last year was that, okay, Caleb Love's not coming. Okay, well, now what? Hunter Dickinson's gone. Oh, okay, well, now what? There wasn't really much of a plan there. So now you you can build out you know you build out the scenarios you build out what things might look like and uh, you go from there again I, I can't stress to people enough this is year one of I know they want to win they want to be competitive but it is year one of a rebuild so you're not going to probably put together the super team that they're going to try and put together at Arkansas or you know some of the money that Louisville will throw around like it's got to be the right guys because as important as it is for them to get off to a good start. I think that they want to have a good foundation in place and have it be sustainable too. You don't want to flip your roster over like this every year if you don't have to. So um, again, I like the plan. I like the vision. I like how it's come together so far. And I expect we'll start seeing some shoes drop uh, the next week or so. Yeah. And I love this quote from Dusty May on uh, the champion circle podcast with, with Jake, Buddy. he says, quote, it's not going to be a quick fix, but we could win big this year. If we get the right people, we can. But as far as fixing any issue or any team, it's a daily approach. It's a minute by minute approach. It's an investment in the people every single day. And then you never know. You plant the bamboo and you never know when it's going to sprout, but you know it's going to. Right now, they're they're planting some bamboo, I, I would say. And, uh, you know, with the coaching staff, with some of the transfer portal recruitments, with some of the high school recruitments as well, Liam McNeely, Connie Ruths uh, as well, that could that could join the fold this season. So we'll monitor all that over at the Wolverine Dot com going forward again the promo code to get you in for two months of premium access for just one dollar is um one so uh, make sure to go and do that like the video on youtube subscribe to our channel as well and michigan hockey i think we all three got them winning why not why could not? be going to the national championship game we got coverage over there both guys will be in minnesota tonight for michigan against boston college we'll see everybody next time